All right. Uh, we're calling the meeting to order at 7 p.m. I, I see Carrie's on here, so I guess she will be taking notes. And thank you, Carrie. Uh, I, I, I think everybody has received their, a copy of the roster by now. Uh, Carrie sent that out earlier today. She did a wonderful job on it. Uh, a lot of work went into making this. So again, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I don't, I don't see any new members. Uh, Muriel, I, that's, that's a new name. But not a new member. But not a new member. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Yeah, any, I, I, uh, I apologize for the net Tuesday night. That was, uh, I still haven't contacted Rick Littlefield. Uh, he had mentioned that he was going to, he wanted to be a net control operator. And uh, so I haven't, I haven't contacted him yet to see if uh, he can do the first Tuesday of the month, but uh, Alex can't do it anymore. So uh, I, I'll contact uh, Rick Littlefield uh, in the near future, probably tomorrow. Um, Paul, KG6SJT. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I don't know about Rick. He has a YOLO amateur radio group up in YOLO. We're both in that group, and that's the first uh, Tuesday of the month. So that oh. may be a conflict for him. Okay. Because he was on the meeting that yeah. we were on Rick is on just Monday. Joining. Well, how about, can he switch with somebody? Hey, Paul, no. you can switch with me if he wants. This is N6 Katie. I don't care which, which Tuesday I have. Oh, well, thank you, Dennis. Greg, is that a possibility? Well, you need to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> I... I <laughs> oh, I, I'm not going to make other people's decisions. <laughs> I, I, I see he's on now. So, uh, Rick, uh, we're talking about you. Oh, great. <laughs> are, are you, do you still want to be a net control operator? Yes, I can still do net control. I sent uh, information over and didn't hear back from anybody. So, um, my preference is not to do it the first Tuesday of the month, but, um, you know, because I do have other commitments for that. Right. But I can that, that's not, that's not a problem because Dennis said he would, uh, he would trade with you. Done deal. So okay. Dennis, which Tuesday do you have? I have the second Tuesday. The second Tuesday. Okay. Right. And, uh, Joe, can you send uh, Rick the information, like the script and the roster? Uh, yeah, I'll send him the last one I have and the, the script that I used. All right. Actually, Dennis came up with a better script, I think, but, uh, but I'll send the one I have. Well, De okay. Well, either one of you, I guess. Why, why don't you go ahead and send it, Joe? That's fine, I'll do it after this. Okay, perfect. And thank you, Rick, uh, so very much. Uh, uh, Greg uh, and, and Yolo was just telling us about your commitment on the first Tuesday, so that's understandable. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's gonna make, a, I think, Yolo County people are taking over your, your club here. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, I know. Exactly. Rick is the second. I grew up in Amador County, so I don't live in Yellow County anymore, but I, I did for almost, geez, almost 30 years. Okay. Wow. What part? Uh, Woodland. Did, no, what part of Amador did you grow up in? Oh, I went to high school in Sutter Creek. Amador. Oh, okay. All right. Good. So uh, again, thank you for stepping up and filling that last net roster. Uh, so any, uh, 
I don't think we have a, an, a, a, a presentation for tonight, but we I do. Just, we do? We do. It, I'll explain it at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you, Howard. All right, good job. Uh, see, uh, upcoming events. Uh, there are no upcoming events. Uh, the, the bike ride has been canceled. So the next, uh, the next upcoming event will be field day in June. Well, uh, it's, uh, it looks like it's coming together. Uh, anybody who wants to uh, participate, uh, contact, oh, probably, uh, I think Dennis said he wanted to uh, uh, be the coordinator for that. So uh, contact Dennis King, and uh, we'll we'll get uh, we'll get the, the the presentation going. And the last it's the last weekend in June. So there are three people who've expressed interest in in doing it now: me, Dennis, and um, I can't remember the guy's name, but the the another new member. Uh, Good. There's also a woman. I think. Uh, I think Carrie or somebody also said she was interested. Yes, right. I'm interested. Okay. Good. Well, good. So we have like three or four people, so that's good. Already, yes, yeah. And the closer we get, the more interest we we will have. So uh, that's it. Looks like it's gonna, going to be happening. So it, again, it's the last weekend in June. Uh, that's the next upcoming event. I want to say that uh, it's going to be a bad fire season. Already 30% uh, of California is in a severe drought, not just a drought, a severe drought, mainly in Southern California, but it's still, uh, it, it, it doesn't look good, especially down there. So we might be called upon to uh, set up an ARIES uh, network uh, for a Red Cross shelter up here. So anybody who is interested in that, please contact Don uh, W6FS and let them know that uh, you want to uh, join Aries and uh, no experience is necessary, uh, that it, it's a wonderful opportunity to help their community. It, it's very much needed and uh, especially the shelters that are up country, there's no cell service and we need a uh, radio network badly. So uh, again, if, if you don't already belong to Aries, contact Don at W6FS and he will get you uh, signed up and we'll, we'll be good to go. So uh, I have a feeling it's going to be very bad this year. Um, but that uh, that's it for upcoming events. And uh, does anybody have any questions about anything before we move on to Howard's presentation? Uh, question. Um, do we know uh, where the field end of $39.20 more than we had last month? And that's the best I can do at this moment. And I'm upstairs, not on the main computer where the, where the file is, so I can't correct it quickly. That's all right. Thank you for that. But being in the in the plus side is better than the negative side so that that is the good news <laughs> definitely yes yes uh and then uh carrie do you have a membership report a new member how many how many members total do we have right now and uh i i think we've gotten a lot of renewals thanks to you sending out all of the the, the letters to everybody uh, asking for uh, renewals from the LAPS members and uh, another fantastic job. But uh, can you just give us a brief uh, membership report on the number of members we have? You're still muted, Carrie. Yes, I clicked the ask to unmute thing. So she should see that on her screen. Can you uh, hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. It looks like there's 57 members currently on my updated roster. 
I'm still awaiting some responses. I added Debbie Colcott as a, a member. Uh, she's with Red Cross. Um, Sandy Beckler is wondering if her dues are paid. I got an email from her. But so things are still in the works and the rough draft is 57 on my roster that's completed for the moment. Well, thank you. I, I know Debbie very well, my Red Cross supervisor, and she lives in West Point. So I, I, she only became a member because she, uh, she took the a ham cram here in Amador County. So we let you know, all of them, uh, uh, whoever took that test, uh, be a member for a year. And uh, so I don't think she will continue to be a member uh, along with um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Larry Warnick. Uh, he also took the test. He, he was uh, automatically a member and he lives in Tuolumne County, I think. So I, I don't think either one of them will be members from now on. But uh, again, thank you so very much. Uh, we at the at our peak, I think a couple of years ago, we were up to uh, 65 members. So we're still we're still doing very well. So that, that's good to see. I'm glad I'm, I'm trying to keep everybody, especially after last year, we we had a we lost the year. Uh, so I hope everybody is still staying motivated and uh, uh, we're, we're trying to come up with activities for everybody. And so I, 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 hope, I hope everybody continues to be a member. Uh, I, I don't wanna say that we're, we're, we're gonna have a lot of uh, Aries work this year, but it, it, we, we just might. So uh, uh, again, just uh, it's extremely important to, for everybody to be a member of this club. Uh, does anybody have any questions of Carrie or John, the treasurer's report or the membership report? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. From what I remember from our treasurer's report last month and our monthly cost, our membership fees are not going to cover our cost for the rest of the year. And we're going to continue going negative. So we need to talk about how we can get rid of some of our expenses pretty soon, I think. Or, uh, or increase the dues. Don't you dare think about cutting the treasurer's salary. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, we have things like, uh, and I, I know Joe likes to have the internet at the repeater site, but that puts our phone and, and internet costs close to $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And that's quite significant. And uh, whereas we need the phone patch, uh, and Joe, I don't want to step on your toes, but uh, the internet is a significant cost every month. Well, okay. How about, uh, we'll discuss that at our next board meeting. Uh, we should be having one pretty soon in person board meeting. Uh, the number of cases in Amateur County, have, have, you know, they're, they're down to about two and three new cases a day now. So it, it's way way down from what it was in December and January. Well, you know, we might think about having a board meeting like some other time other than right before this meeting, because if we're going to continue having the meetings online, the uh, we could do the board meeting, you know, at a different time. Yeah, we could do that too. Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, if we, if we just, you know, I, I don't know what I, yeah, I don't know about April, but the way things are going, we just might have an in-person meeting in April, both a general and a, a board meeting. But if we if we don't, we, we can have a board meeting uh, uh, anytime. So yeah, why don't we discuss either you know, cutting expenses or uh, raising the dues? And we're definitely not getting rid of auto patch. That's uh, too valuable of a resource for us to have. Uh, but we'll we'll discuss this at the at the board meeting, uh, whenever whenever that is. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and we could also think about a fundraiser of some kind, maybe a swap meet or something, 
uh, later in the year. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Or our bar barbecue or swap meat. Yes, definitely. So that, that's good. I'm so looking forward to this summer. <laughs> it's, it's a, and I think a lot of people are. Anyway, uh, all right, thank you, John. Uh, I think, does anybody have any other questions? I have a, uh, uh, a request. Sure. If you're looking for something to do towards the end of July, you may have heard of the event called the Tevis. It's a 100-mile uh, event that goes from basically Squaw Valley into Auburn. Horses. Uh, horses. It is an equestrian event. And uh, I've been heavily involved with that for, uh, I think this is coming up in my 20th year. Anyway, um, there are some openings for people if you are interested in getting out and doing something up in either up in the mountains or later in the day. The event Communications runs from five o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the morning the next day. The aid stations don't run, no aid station runs all that, that entire time. Um, so if you're interested in possibly getting out and, and doing something, <laughs> since most of our events have been canceled this year, they're still looking at trying to, they think they're gonna be able to pull off the Tevis this year because it's gonna be later in July. Um, and having said that, um, you can contact me if you would uh, like to volunteer. And one of the things that we use heavily is uh, Packet and Winlink to get the information because we track every rider from the time they start until the time they cross the finish line. So if you'd like to get out and, and use your uh, Winlink skills, which are what uh, is being which works really well for the Red Cross. Um, we can give you an opportunity to do that. So anyway, thank you. All right, thank you, Rick. And I, I know Greg is also involved with uh, Tevis every year. Greg writes our, uh, he wrote our a little routine for us to make it easier to input the data. Yes, uh -huh. I think it's been a, a great resource. Good, good. All right. Well, thank you for that. And if, if, if anybody has any questions, contact either Greg or Rick. Uh, and it's at the end of July, so there's, there's plenty of time. Uh, again, uh, yeah, just contact either one of them for further information. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I do. If we have something to sell, is it okay to take pictures and then send it to the group, the group? Of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. But you're not going to be around, y'all. <laughs> the, the house is going to be on the market on the 15th. Okay. So, so you might be around. Yes. <laughs> You don't know. I know. It's a, it's, 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 I know. I know. Well, okay. it takes 30 days to close. So, you know, they'll be around for a month or so. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, good. Good. All right. Any other questions or comments or complaints? Uh, hearing none, uh, we'll go to you, Howard. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is a, another one of my uh, group uh, participation programs, try to get uh, everybody involved that's uh, here on uh, uh, the Zoom uh, tonight. And uh, I've asked this question a few times and sometimes it comes up uh, on the radio, but I thought we could uh, just go around. Uh, anybody that'd like to participate can. I hope maybe everybody will, but an interesting question that I'm always asked is, how in the world did you get into ham radio? And um, for everybody, it's a different story. So um, uh, would uh, the group uh, like to participate? Yes, of course. Okay, good. Well, I've got one uh, participant already. That's good. 
Well, I'll um, I'll start out and tell you how I got into ham radio, and and uh, it goes back to um, about 1954, and um, two um, ham radio operators um, uh, got on the air on my street, and uh, this is back when. Most of the radio communication was on AM. And um, AM got into everything uh, around it at, during those times. And uh, you could pick up uh, your neighbors, a ham radio neighbors on your uh, telephone, on your television, on your AM radio. So um, I started to hear all this going on on the radio and I got very interested in what it was. And so um, I went down the street and there were big antennas up in the sky, both houses. So I knocked on the door and I made a new friends and these guys were both ham radio operators. And um, I asked them what it was all about. And so they said, well, come on into my uh, ham shack. So I did, and uh, uh, at that time, there were uh, lots of sunspots, and uh, uh, these guys were working uh, around the world uh, almost any time they got on the radio, and that was amazing to me. Uh, so uh, I... Uh, I got a, a Heath kit receiver. It wasn't a very good one, but I could pick up uh, ham radio um, signals on the receiver. And uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, an article in uh, uh, a publication called The Boy Mechanic. Some of you may remember that book. It was an orange colored book, as I recall. Anyway, uh, on how to make a, um, a, uh, a CW uh, key and uh, light bulb that you could send uh, Morse code on with a light. And uh, my father helped me build it. And so that was uh, how I got introduced to uh, Morse code with that light bulb and, and uh, a battery and uh, a little piece of galvanized steel that I use for a key. And um, <clears throat> so that went along for a while. And uh, periodically, uh, I would kind of revisit ham radio or I would get a copy of a magazine. And my interest really never dwindled. But um, uh, go fast forwarding a little bit, um, in 1965, I was uh, thinking about uh, things I wanted to accomplish and do, and I had uh, pretty well gotten squared away with college, and so uh, I uh, wrote down a list of things, and one of them was to become a ham radio operator. So anyway, I was home for a while, and I went up the street again, knocked on one of the doors and said, hey, I want to become a ham radio operator. Will you give me a novice license test? And he said, yeah, sure. I got to find out how to, how I do that. But he said, I'll take care of it. I'll call uh, the FCC and find out how I administer the license to you. That was the way it was done for novice. So anyway, I got my novice license in 1965. And... Um, I really enjoyed ham radio, uh, but I went back to college and I got busy again. And uh, I uh, let my license lapse uh, after having it for um, 10 years. So um, I, uh, didn't do anything with ham radio until my son came home from a Boy Scout meeting with a code oscillator and a, and a key. 
and said, you know, I really like this Morse code. Uh, you were a ham radio operator, weren't you, Dad? And I said, yeah. And so anyway, uh, he said, well, he said, uh, I want to learn Morse code and maybe I'll become a ham radio operator. And so he played around with the code key and one of the other kids and scouts and pretty quick, it was apparent my son had a real knack for Morse code. Just immediately almost he was uh, doing very well with it so I decided uh, to help him out and get a uh, station set up and what happened of course is I got interested in ham radio again too I got bit by the bug and uh, so uh, he's still a ham radio operator I'm still a ham radio operator and active and uh um, it, it's been a great, great hobby. I've met a lot of people uh, around the world. Um, yeah, I have a good friend in England that I talk to every week. We used to talk ham radio, and we're still planning to do that. But during the down times with ham radio, we've gotten on uh, Echo Link, and we've gotten on Skype, and now we're on FaceTime. So... Um, I've had a lot of, uh, made a lot of good friends uh, uh, with ham radio here in this club and in the Bay Area and down in uh, Tulare where I lived before. So uh, that's how I got into ham radio. Um, so I pass it over to you, uh, uh, Mr. President. You can tell us how you got involved in ham radio. Okay, well, thank you, Howard. That was, that was a great story. and. Uh, I'll, I'll just go down the list uh, and call on people and, and if, yeah, feel free to, you know, decline to uh, talk, but uh, uh, I'll just go down the list. Uh, that, That's that good. Way, that, I think that'll be easier. So yes. uh, next on the list is me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I grew up in San Jose, uh, went to school down there, worked down there. Uh, after 32 and a half years at the post office, I retired and moved up to Amateur County. Uh, and so in, I, that was in 2003. In 2007, I was down in Jackson uh, at an emergency preparedness fair. And I had no idea what was going on. And uh, the Red Cross had a booth there. And so I stopped by the booth and they asked me if I wanted to uh, join the Red Cross. And I said, sure, I wasn't, I was retired. I wasn't doing anything up here. And uh, so I joined the Red Cross. And right after I joined, it was strongly recommended that I, I get my ham radio license because uh, uh, most of the house fires that we were responding to were uh, up here and uh, up in Pioneer and there's no cell service up here, and uh, it was strongly recommended that I get my uh, license. Uh, so I did in, in February of 2007, I got my uh, uh, technician license. And uh, so just mainly for emergency communications. And, uh, and then in, what was it, three years ago, four years ago, I got my general license. Uh, I, I, I scored 100% on the technician test, but uh, I, I barely passed the general test. So that, I, I don't think I'll be going for my extra license anytime soon. Uh, but I have my general license and uh, I've been uh, heavily involved with the Red Cross and the Ham Radio Club and now Search and Rescue and uh, so it's, it's mainly uh, uh, emergency communications that uh, I have my license. So I'm not really a, a technical guy, uh, but, you know, a lot of people uh, other in, in the club are. So I, I don't, uh, uh, if I have any technical questions, I can always ask them. So uh, basically, that, that's it. All right, uh, Joe, you're next. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what list you're on and what order. I, I'm not sure the the people's names are in the same are are in the list in the same order for everyone who's in a Zoom meeting. So, uh, 
anyway, uh, because you, normally you're at the top. Um, but anyway, so um, I, uh, let's see, I'll do this really quick. Um, I've been licensed since 1983. Um, I um, was a shortwave listener for probably 15 years before I became licensed. Um, when I was a kid, I used to come home every night. It, it, I was home for a couple hours before my parents came home uh, because they both worked. And uh, so uh, I would come home and I had a shortwave receiver that a friend of my dad's who's a ham had given us. Um, it was a receiver he wasn't using anymore. Um, so it had those, you know, things that glow inside of it, you know, tubes and everything. Uh, and so I come home and fire that up and I'd listen to Radio Moscow and Cuba and Israel and South Africa and stuff like that. And whenever we did something in school that, that involved one of those countries, I would make a recording on a cassette tape of the news broadcast from that country the previous day and I'd give it to the teacher. And it says, oh, you should play this. This is, this is what was on the news last night in that country, right? Because all those countries had English broadcasts, right? So that's how I got into radio actually. Um, was I was always like interested in monitoring stuff and I used to monitor military frequencies and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And I did that for years, right? Before I ever thought about becoming ham. Um, and then um, when I was in college, I started working on a repeater system because there was another guy who was in, in, the, in the E department, uh, was a ham. Um, I still know him actually. And uh, he was working on the repeater system for Baltimore, which was a big complex multi-site system um, that actually had lots of receivers and a voter and a transmitter and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't a single site repeater. Uh, and it was all done with, uh, again, G prog line equipment. So it was all like tubes and stuff. So it required a lot of service, right? Like we were always going up to the top of buildings to, to like change a tube or, or swap out a transceiver or whatever, or a receiver or a link receiver or whatever. And so I was doing, working on repeaters for like five years and I wasn't a ham, right? I had nothing, to, I, I knew about electro electronics, but I didn't know anything about, you know, like being a, being a ham, right? Um, and I finally, at the, when I, a couple of years after I graduated from college, I finally like took the test and, and uh, became a tech. Uh, I had to do it at the FCC because that's what they, they, you had to go to the FCC back then. There weren't any volunteer examiners. Um, and uh, later on, I became a general because I wanted to do HF, but I didn't actually live any place where I could do HF for a long time. So I was a tech for, I don't know, probably 15 years or something like that. And then, then I finally like moved to Belmont in California. Uh, I, became a, I became a Swiss radio amateur, interestingly enough. HB9NDB was my call sign in Switzerland. Uh, when I lived in Switzerland, I actually took the test in German to become a Swiss radio amateur. Uh, and we had a radio club at Sivagagi where I worked. Um, and so uh, we had, and that was the first time I was on HF because when I took the test in Switzerland, I took the test to get an HF license. Um, and then when I came back to the United States, I took the general test um, in the US. So, um, so, and I've been, and that was, I came back to the United States in 1997 or 1996, I came back to the US. So um, there we are. And I've been, you know, licensed ever since then. Anyway, that's me. Great story. All right. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. All, all of these are great stories. Uh, Dennis King. Can you see me okay? Is the focus and everything all right? No. No? No, we just have your name, call sign. I wonder why the uh, camera's not working. Your camera's turned off. You need to turn video on. Oh, I wonder how I do that. Uh, there's probably a button down in the lower left to do that. It says start video. Yeah, it'll say start video on it, wherever that is. Maybe, maybe on the top, too. Wait a minute. Here, I, here wait. Start video. Okay. Now, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there you are. All right. You guys see me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I uh, couldn't wait to get to high school because I heard that the high school that I was going to had a radio club and they actually had a uh, two semester radio curriculum. So as soon as I got to high school, I joined the club and uh, started taking uh, code practice sessions. And I think when I was about 
uh, 15 years old, I got my novice license, which uh, doesn't exist anymore, but you had to pass, you had to be able to pass uh, five words a minute receiving code and then the exam, you know, the written exam. And then uh, uh, shortly after I had that about a year, I think you could only have it a year and then it expired. And so if you hadn't moved up to general by that time, then you essentially had to start over. So I got my general when I was about 16 years old. And uh, the, uh, the radio uh, club that I was in, they had a teacher whose a whole sole purpose was to teach electronics. And the high school I went to was a very progressive school. This was in Iowa. And we had a two semester electronics program. The first semester, we built a power supply, a 500 volt power supply. And the second semester, we built a 50 watt transmitter. And it uh, worked on 20 meters, CW only. And part of our uh, uh, curriculum or program, whatever, was to make a overseas contact with it. All right. The, uh, it was called a DX contact. So I, uh, I got on the air and I made a contact with uh, Canada and that, that counted. So I, I did that for my electronics program. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, I decided uh, that I wanted to be a technical writer. And this was, uh, nobody knew what a technical writer was in those days, there probably weren't very many around. But anyway, I went to, uh, went got a journalism degree and then I went and got a two year degree in electronics uh, from uh, Los Angeles City College. And I worked most of my life as a technical writer. I've been a ham knob figure since 1956. So what is that 56 to, that's a lot of years. So <laughs> and my, my primary, I didn't operate anything but CW for the first 20 years as I was a ham and I still love CW, but I do a little sideband now and then and a little bit of digital, but my true love is CW. So still a CW op, that's, that's about it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dennis. That was 65 years ago. That's a long I'm time only, ago. Uh, I'm only 69, so yeah, I've right. <laughs> been a ham <laughs> most of my life. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Next up, uh, Jim Marshall. Am I on? Yeah, I guess I'm yeah. on. Right. We see you. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, my little, little yellow square goes on. Um, I think I got most of you beat. Uh, I took an electronics course in high school back in 1954. Uh, the teacher, we had a little code in there, but didn't get me really excited, but I enjoyed electronics. And a teacher we had, uh, Mr. Walker, Lloyd Walker, was the physics teacher, which I loved physics. So I had him for that in the electronics course. And I really didn't get much involved in, in uh, ham radio until just after I was married. Uh, my best man and his dad were both hams. And so I talked it over with my wife and said, do you think I should? She said, sure, why not? So I contacted uh, my best man and he gave me my novice license, which I passed. Uh, in the meantime, I was in, in uh, uh, the reserves, Navy reserves, and I was uh, uh, striking for radio operator. So I, my code was coming along pretty good. So in about 1957, I got my novice license had that for a year and just a little after that, passed a general uh, at 13 words a minute. And the big thing was, had to go up to San Francisco to take that damn test. <laughs> and Battery Street was no place to go, even back then. So I had my general for, oh, I don't know, another 10 years or so, and went back up to San Francisco and took the advanced class uh, again, Battery Street passed that, had a ball taking that, uh, studied for all the exams uh, using the ARRL manual. Uh, and it was so close to the FCC exams. It was, if you missed it, you you couldn't, couldn't read. So anyway, I kept my, my advanced class up until about uh, 
four or five years ago when I said, I'm getting too old for the advanced class. So I got the manuals out and studied and took my extra class. And it took me two passes, two tests to do it. First one, I missed it by two. And the second one, I passed it by three. So I've had almost all of them except a tech class license. Uh, so I've been in business oh, 63, 64 years being a ham. While I was in college, it sort of waned a bit, but I didn't, uh, I kept kept going. I'd get on the air once in a while just to keep my license active. And so I kept my license active the whole time through. So I've had a continuous license for like 63 years. So been a long time, seen a lot of changes. So man, <laughs> I'm glad I did it when I did. <laughs> wow, that's great. Uh, 1954, I was two years old. <laughs> that, that's amazing. All right, uh, next up is uh, George Russell. Oh, me? Okay. Yes. So I um, grew up in the Bay Area. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Grew up in the Bay Area. In 1960, I went in the Marine Corps. I was in tanks. And in tanks, uh, they have a lot of radios. Uh, they were very poor radios. You couldn't hear very well. And they were huge. But they worked. You could actually talk to airplanes. And um, I did not learn any CW. I had friends with uh, calm communications. I, the only thing I learned was my name. And did I did did it out did it did it did it dow 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 that's all I learned. So after that, uh, skip twenty years or uh, sixteen years, and I got the sailing bug. So uh, VHF radio, small boat. I went from that, and around nineteen eighty, I had a larger boat with much more equipment and uh, VHF radio and single sideband, went to Mexico for three years and uh, got to talk all over the place with this single sideband. And uh, coming back from Mexico, I uh, got the four wheel drive bug and I had family in Pioneer. So we came up and, and experienced the uh, Squaw Ridge Trail up here and uh, eventually uh, fell in with the um, mother load rock crawlers. And so I just had a CB radio and they said, we got to get a ham radio. So I took the ham radio test. I had studied for a long, long time, very hard. And I had one wrong, one wrong answer. Now the, the and that was in Pine Grove. And the, uh, the guy that uh, corrected my test said, you only got one wrong. If you hadn't, if you hadn't changed that one answer, but I changed three answers, so but I only got one wrong, and uh, uh, so I uh, that's how I got my uh, ham license, and that's where I am now. Very good. Wow, all of these years and years of experience it, it's uh, incredible. It's good to see uh, the order on the participant list keeps changing. So uh, uh, I guess uh, Robert Montgomery was up here at the top of the list, but uh, there he is. Okay, go ahead, Robert. Okay, Paul, um, let's see here. I made some notes while other people were speaking here. So if I look down, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, I attended high school in San Angelo, Texas. And at the time, uh, a lot of my friends were involved in electronics. And, um, you know, mostly just hobbyists. And uh, uh, the, um, I think the reason for that, uh, that whole group was uh, kind of uh, underwritten by General Telephone and Electronics. And, um, you know, when field day would come along or anything else, or if we needed any gear, you know, it was at our disposal. We basically had access to cherry pickers and enormous uh, 
uh, truck mounted generators, uh, as many as we wanted, whenever we wanted, and we could just pull all kinds of uh, uh, fun things off as a result. And we had um, monthly meetings and we all, uh, uh, you know, we were all friends and um, some of us have actually stayed in touch to this day. Uh, my call sign, K6FNI, is actually derived uh, from my friend, uh, uh, my mentor's call sign, which is K5FNI. Uh, and so after being out of touch with him for many years, we got back in touch and um, it's been great. He's uh, continuing to serve as my mentor here. Uh, but anyway, uh, as a result of the association with GTE &E and um, my friends who were all learning code, I learned code and uh, uh, soon after uh, passed the um, novice exam and um, uh, you know I I met up with um, uh, I think a general or maybe I guess a general class uh, license holder in town because uh, we were uh, way away from uh, an FCC uh, you know site and so uh, I um, I barely passed the novice license, as I recall. I had difficulty with the electronics, and there's circuitry and all that, and questions involving that that we had to answer, and it wasn't particularly easy for me. But uh, anyway, I spent about a year because the novice license was only good for a year before it lapsed. Made hundreds of contacts all around the country country on uh, with CW on 40 meters. I was using a, a Heathkit DX uh, uh, 60 that I built along with a, um, a Hammerland uh, Navy surplus uh, receiver that probably weighed um, between the receiver and the power supply probably weighed 120 pounds. I mean, it was enormous, but uh, anyway, it served me well, and I became pretty <laughs> proficient at CW. So uh, anyway, that's how I got started, but then my high school was pretty advanced. They were offering a, um, a vocational course in data processing. Back, This is back when uh, everything was, uh, all the data processing involved punch cards and dedicated machines for different functions like sorters and reproducers and counting machines, etc. And so uh, anyway, uh, I got into computers uh, shortly after that when I was attending college and uh, uh, dedicated my life as a uh, computer software engineer working for uh, uh, major uh, computer companies, both here and uh, in England. I spent three and a half years in England, and uh, uh, that was in the uh, mid to late 60s. I got back here, and I was still, I've always been interested in electronics, but never really had the time for it until I retired. And then I started getting more and more back to what I done in high school and um, decided it was time to get licensed again. So I took the technician exam. I think I missed one or two questions. Took the general, I missed one question and I aced the um, extra class exam. I think uh, the guys were kind of amazed. <laughs> but I spent, uh, probably I dedicated myself for three months uh, studying before I took the extra class exam. Uh, but anyway, uh, since then I mostly worked uh, CW 40 meters and you know, I'm on two meters and six meters most evening, evenings and uh, really enjoy the hobby. I was a member of the club back, uh, 
shortly after I got license, uh, relicensed, relicensed, and um, uh, I don't know uh, when all kinds of changes were going on the club, on in the club, and I just wasn't able to make it up uh, from Jackson to club meetings. I dropped out, but recently rejoined the club. You know, I may be able to take part in field day today uh, or this year, not certain. Uh, last year, the heat just got to me and I decided to cancel out on my personal plans for field day. It was just too darn hot, couldn't handle it. And uh, so anyway, uh, let's see here. Uh, did I miss anything here? No, I think that's uh, I think that's about it. I spend I've got a really great electronics bench with all kinds of test gear, and right now I'm uh, uh, kind of going back to my roots uh, with early uh, 1960s computers, and I'm uh, got a project going where I'm uh, 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 reactivating uh, uh, some. Uh, poor memory. All the machines back then before solid state memory had tiny ferrite cores uh, strung by uh, very young ladies with good eye eyesight into matrices that were stacked into uh, stacks. And even with that, uh, uh, a machine typically only had about 16k, uh, 16,000 characters of memory. So it was really difficult from a programming point of view to squeeze a program into that kind of machine. Uh, but that's how I spent my life. I spent my life writing um, system software for uh, ICL and for um, um, Singer business machines involved with some of the earliest uh, point of sale uh, terminal development uh, that went into Montgomery Ward and Sears all over the country. And then I, um, uh, well, you know, this core memory project is really, really pushing the limits for me because I'm not a double E, you know, my background's in computer science. And so, uh, well, you know, it's a challenge to say the least, but it's, it's great because when I start stop learning, I will die. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. K6F and I, Robert and Jackson, over. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, that was great. Uh, I remember when we used to have our meetings at the senior center down in Jackson. So uh, uh, that, that was a long time ago, though. Anyway, uh, Don, W6FFS, you're up next. Uh, yes, uh, maybe I should give you some video, I guess. I don't know. Are you wearing clothes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Oop, it won't start. You shave. shave. Paul did shave. Yeah, it won't start. Oh, well, anyhow, uh, that's my, uh, my dog. His name is Sarge, okay? Okay. He's three years old. Uh, let's see. Uh, I got involved in ham. Oh, I moved up to Pioneer in 2009 from San Diego area, uh, where I worked as an electrical engineer for a company for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, in 2010, we had a big storm uh, up here. We lost all power. We lost phones. We lost TV. Uh, we were had we were isolated. Big. Uh, big snow banks, uh, power lines and power poles down all over the place. So I lived through that somehow. And I saw, and I was gonna get out my CB radios, which I was a CBer down south and out in the desert. And uh, I saw an a, a article in the newspaper and it was uh, about the uh, Ham Radio Club uh, in uh, uh, Pine Grove. And I said, oh, well. and so I talked to my wife and I said, you know, maybe I'll go down there. And she says, well, maybe you should because that's the 
better hobby than raking pine needles, like it was my hobby there for a while. Anyhow, so met a bunch of great guys down there, and uh, Howard and and uh, Joe didn't see you down there, but a lot of the a lot of the guys, a lot of the and Dennis was there. I remember Dennis being there, and uh, John and and. All right, thank thank you to both of you. Uh, that that was a good story. Okay, Carrie, you're up next. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Well, I'm not really a ham yet. I feel like I'm just a piglet. I got Carrie, my technician's license. Carrie, you need to turn on you need to turn on your video though. Well, no, no, she she doesn't have to. I don't think she wants to. So she have to, okay. It's it's not necessary. Okay. Okay. I don't I'm not sure how to do that. That, but can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. Well, you can tell I'm I'm not a technical person, but I got in into this for the emergency comms um, aspect of it. My husband and I were evacuated for eight days from the Butte fire uh, in a class A with three chihuahuas, a hound dog, and a cat that meowed for 13 hours straight. <laughs> So um, where we live right now, we're about three miles in a one lane road that's very, very rural. And it's the only way out. After that, it's just thick brush and the river. So I got interested in ham so that I don't die in a fire. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to uh, learning a lot. I, I have a lot to learn. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Carrie. And you brought up the Butte fire. The uh, the ham our ham club would played a big role in that down at the Jackson Rancheria. We had a with uh, uh, Aries Network set up. We, we operated twenty four hours a day for I think about a week, and so that was a, another uh, community service that this club provided and yeah it was very much appreciated by everybody involved so uh, uh hopefully we don't have another butte fire up here but uh yeah we always have to be prepared uh next hopefully up, that's uh, great thank you you know what i'm sorry you, what was that i said yeah hopefully that's great thank you and also i wanted okay. to say that last Saturday I, I got to make a stub J pole antenna and a 450 ohm ladder line slim jim antenna to throw up and treat. All right, <laughs> that's good. Okay, next up, uh, Greg and Lucille. Okay, um, we'll put the picture up a little bit. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, pretty boring. I uh, got started. Uh, Lucille's dad was a ham. And when I'd go down to their house, we'd go down to visit. He had it all, his whole shack in a closet. And I thought that was interesting. So I came back to Davis and uh, studied for the technician, passed that. Then I had to learn CW before I could get the general. Then I picked up the general and then a little bit later, the extra. Got involved with emergency communications in Aries and everything else has kind of fallen away since then. <laughs> so involved with that, got involved with, uh, because I was um, had done some computer programming and websites, got asked to do Red Cross forms or FL message, and then the Windlink development team asked me to do some work, and that's been over three years, almost full time. So it keeps me out of trouble now that we're retired. So that's it. Um, here's Lucille. Hi. Yeah, I know where Greg is nights, so it's good. Um, <laughs> My dad uh, got his, he was the kind of guy who would uh, take apart radios and put them together. 
when he was in high school, he and his friends, and he got his license when he was 15. And um, he, he uh, was on top of the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower um, during the war, uh, putting up radios and things like that. And then he, he pretty much, like Greg said, had the ham radio. There were six siblings. And so he, he had his ham station in the closet because he didn't have any room. And, um, and so then when Greg and I got married, Greg got very interested in it and learned from my dad and also learned Morse code and got his license uh, first. And then I got mine after him. And I got mine when Morse code was not um, required. So I was happy about that. And we were, Greg and I were up at the Butte Fire at uh, Jackson Rancheria. And that was very rewarding, um, oh. helping. And um, yeah, we, we got the phone call at 4 a.m. And we went up there and yeah. it was, uh, the Rancheria bent over backwards to help people. And uh, it, it was, they did such a wonderful job. And that was a very, I, I really enjoyed that experience. So that's my story. Uh, and you're sticking to it. All right, great, thank yeah. you. And thank uh -huh. you for being up there at the Butte Fire. Thank you everybody uh, you know, who was up there. Oh. That uh, it was a much needed service uh, that it is, you know, it just goes, goes beyond words, uh, the, the, the work that everybody did. Anyway, uh, next up is uh, Matt Leach. Um, some some of you are older than or have been a ham way longer than I've been alive, but I'm, I think I'm one of the younger ones. <laughs> uh, back in high school, I was in Boy Scouts, and um, someone had a a vinyl record um, of Morse code. They made a copy of that onto a tape. And I was trying to listen to it. It didn't work back then. So fast forward a whole, whole bunch of years. Uh, when I met Paul, uh, was on search and rescue. Um, in for Amador County, they um, recommended that we get our licenses so we could communicate with amongst the, ourselves without having to go, get, go down to get the department radios. So sometimes we needed to respond from our, our houses rather than um, going down to the uh, sheriff office. And so that, that's when I um, got my technician license and that was after Morse code also. So I didn't, didn't need any of that. So. That, um, I did upgrade my general about four years ago, uh, so I've been a ham for about well, 14, 15 years. Um, in and out of interest, um, I, I, I bought a new radio uh, about a month ago, and I, I, I still haven't programmed it yet, so it just, it, it comes and goes in spurts. Um, what I really like about this is what you, you've all been sharing, um, you know, and like Paul said, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a techie person, an electronic person, but there, there are people here and just the um, uh, what was that? What's that? Um, what's that phrase for someone that helps another ham out? Um, Elmer. Elmer. You know the the Elmer um, concept of, of ham radios is awesome. You know, it just, yeah, if someone has a need, someone will jump right in there and so uh, that's fun. Um, I got about three more years worth of work working. Then I want to get get more back into radios. I want to get back into search and rescue and uh, and. Uh, slow down a little bit. Hopefully they don't slow down that much. So just yeah, put my time at a different use. So my my story is short and sweet. Well, it, you're right about the sweet. That's a good, it's a good story. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rick Littlefield, you're the last person. Save the best for last, right? That's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I kind of had an interest in radio uh, in grade school, but I, you know, never uh, did anything with it. A uh, little bit in high school, I would listen on the shortwave and stuff, but I didn't know how to get a, you know, uh, I, I'd read the Heathkit catalog and 
dream about all this stuff that you could do with the Heathkit radios, but I, I, I never had an elm, so I didn't have anybody help point me in the right direction. Went into college. Uh, of course, uh, I, I left well, I left the area to go to college uh, up in Oregon, and uh, at that time, the CB radio craze was hot and heavy, so I had one in my car and talked to people going back and forth to, to Oregon, which would help keep me awake in the long drives in the night. Went from there into the uh, Air Force um, and joined the Air Force Sea of the World. My first active duty station after initial training was uh, Mart uh, Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. And I grew up here and went to high school in Sutter Creek. So <laughs> right back in the Sacramento area. Um, was uh, studied uh, part of the, part of my curriculum in there at, at, uh, at Mather, which is a training base was uh, electronic warfare and uh it uh, got my interest in electronics going again and uh so then i got a hold of a got a hold of some books and and studied and uh, found out that I either had to go to fresno or, or san francisco and so I scheduled a day off and drove to san francisco to the battery street and took my test there and uh, that was in 82 uh, oh back up a little bit in college i did uh I did get my third class commercial endorsement uh, or light, third class license endorsement for broadcasting. And um, during a, a one year when I was taking a break from going to college up in Oregon, I actually worked at uh, what was KNGT in Jackson, the voice of the gold country <laughs> at the time. So uh, then off to uh, uh, into the Air Force, flying all over the world. Took my HT with me. I only had a technician license. So in other countries, I could only listen. Um, picked up my general class somewhere along the way there. And uh, we had a great HF radio in the airplane. And on uh, long flights across the US, uh, it was just sitting there doing nothing. So I put it to use a couple of times, which was kind of fun. It's a great signal you get up at 30,000 feet. Uh, left the Air Force. Uh, Picked up, I picked up my general class uh, four years ago. I picked up my extra class. Um, I also volunteered up there to the to the Butte Fire. I was an EC at Yolo County at the time, and so they were looking for volunteers. And Greg and uh, Lucille volunteered, and I think Bill Gustafson uh, came up too. And uh, I came up and volunteered and pulled a shift up there. And then uh, my best, my most interest is uh, is public service and how to do stuff out in the field. I'm not a big uh, guy on for contesting, but um, um, I like sitting, going out and setting stuff up and making it work and making it work under less than ideal circumstances just to prove that it can be done. <laughs> that's, that's the fun part, which yeah, I, I mentioned the Tevis before. We have some pretty rough areas along the Tevis ride, and uh, we are able to get a signal out from everywhere, and sometimes we have to work really hard to do it. So... That's it. Thank you. I got to go put the grandkids in the bed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. All, every one of these was, was a great story. Every, every one. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, it's good to see. Uh, there's nobody else on the list. So uh, thank you, Howard. That was, thank uh, you, Howard. That, that was fun. It was. Yes. It, uh, a lot of fun. Great idea. Yes. Uh, before we close the meeting, does anybody have any questions about anything? Uh, comments, complaints? Yeah, me. Go ahead, Jim. I still don't have any information about next month. I'm, we're pushing, but they're resisting. So uh, I don't know whether the uh, uh, clubhouse is gonna be available for you towards the end of the month or not. So I'll let you know if I find out. Uh, okay, how about we have another Zoom meeting for our uh, monthly meeting ne next month then? That sounds good. Just to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Good, thank you. And we still can have a, uh, a board meeting if everybody wants. I'll send out emails uh, uh, checking on the uh, response for that, but uh, 
uh, we'll we'll have another Zoom meeting for our general meeting ne uh, next I, month in April. I could do a Zoom meeting for the board meeting separately. I just don't want to do them at the same time. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, and uh, I did determine one thing during this meeting, uh, which means I'm going to have to paste together a whole bunch of videos in order to make the video of this meeting. Uh, is uh, I need to shut my remote off because if there's somebody on uh, digital modes on 40 meters, it crashes my computer. <laughs> oh, my computer wow. crashed three times during this meeting because there was somebody over there transmitting. Uh, and I didn't realize that's what it was until like yeah. the third time I heard the digital grunge on the stereo. And I said, oh, wait a minute, the, that, that thing's actually on. Oh, okay. Um, so so that, that, that's why we kept losing you. That when I disappeared, it's because of <laughs> hard reset. And I had to go through the whole reboot sequence and then get the meeting again. And fortunately, the meeting doesn't, I, I didn't know this about Zoom, but the meetings are truly in the cloud so that when the organizer of the meeting goes away, it doesn't go, it doesn't drop. Right. I think I said, I think I yeah, said some parameter in Zoom that said when I start a meeting to let it continue when I'm, when if I disconnect and I'm glad I did now. Right. Good. Okay. Well, uh, if anybody, nobody has any other fur further comments or questions, and we'll close the meeting at 819.